Hello. In this video, we get to talk about probability. Um, it's, you know, come to a point in the term when um, we are starting to, you know, switch our thinking to inference, like, you know, what does that big population look like uh, with regards to some characteristic? Maybe um, we're interested in estimating a population mean or a population proportion. Well, we're going to be able to estimate that based on characteristics of a sample. Now, our conclusions are needing, we need to base our conclusions on something. And so what we sort of use is a probability statement. Now, I am kind of foreshadowing uh, a few weeks from now, but um, needless to say, we need to understand what probability is. We need to understand how to do some kind of basic calculations with probability. So what we'll do is um, define some terms. Uh, there will be um, in this section some technology that we can use, or at least I'll discuss it, um, where we could estimate what some probabilities are. And then also we will use some probability rules and formulas to calculate some probabilities by hand. Um, and in doing so, what we have to do is, is identify if events are independent there we go. Uh, if events are disjoint, if they're complementary, these are all sort of topics that we need to get comfortable with because we use these skills later on. Um, some additional topics that have been added to this section is some counting techniques. They're called permutations and combinations. And this is a, a an important concept because um, what we'll eventually need to wrap our heads around is how many possible samples could I end up obtaining or get, you know, how many different unique random samples from some population? If I have a population of a thousand people and I need to randomly select 20 of them, well, gosh, there's a, a lot of different possible sets of 20, right? I got to get my head wrapped around how many that actually is because in reality, we only randomly select 20 individuals. That's just one combination out of, you know, millions and millions that could exist. And so anyway, that is all going to set us up for inference. So we'll start with talking about what is probability. So inference methods that we are going to be learning are based off of random samples. Therefore, what we have to consider is this idea of chance behavior. You know, what would we expect to see um, and one thing I can tell you is that chance behavior or these random outcomes are unpredictable in the short run, but they do have predictable patterns in the long run. Now I'll show you some graphs about what I mean. Um, but first, the definition of probability, the probability of some outcome, something that I'm interested in seeing is defined as the proportion of times the outcome would occur in a very long series of repetitions. Um, so some notation that we need to get comfortable right off the bat is how do I write out probability? Um, prob you're using probability notation. So probability, um, the way I write it out at first is a capital P and then directly following it, I have some parentheses and then I can spell out some outcome inside of the parentheses. You know, so I might be interested in you know, say the probability of rolling uh, doubles, which we'll see in just a bit. Um, and so that probability would equal, and then we'll find out what the answer is in just a little while. Um, but this whole entire piece would be read as the probability of rolling doubles. Again, just so we can get comfortable with some notation. Okay, so I said that probability is unpredictable in the short run. So I think we all are familiar with a typical coin, say a quarter. It's got a head side, which you can see here, head, little face there. And then on the other side, we call that tails. And so if you flipped this quarter 10 times, one, two, three, four, five, you know, 10 flips, that's it, we would expect to see. I don't know, about five of them being heads. And we expect this, you know, provided it's a balanced coin, because, you know, if there's two sides to a coin, half of the time I would imagine a head, half of the time I would imagine a tail. Now, when I'm preparing these notes, what I did is I went ahead and flipped the coin 10 times and I recorded for each flip the proportion of heads that I observed. 
So when I only flipped the coin one time, I saw a head, and so the proportion of heads, one over one, all right, well, that's 100%. Now, I know that the true proportion of flipping a head is not 100%, um, but that's what I observed on my very first run. Okay, so I increase the number of trials, in other words, the times that I repeat this probability experiment. So now I flipped it two times. Well, when I flipped it two times, I observed a tail. So for that specific you know, time, uh, if I considered the two times that I flipped, I got a head, I got a tail. All right, so the proportion of heads when I flipped it twice was 50%. But then when I flipped it three times, I got another head and notice that when I have three flips, two of them were heads, one of them was tails, the proportion of heads ends up being 67% or 0.67. So you can see that when I'm only flipping a coin a couple of times, the proportion of heads is bouncing around quite a bit. Now we said that we would expect about five of them to be heads, but of course that's not going to be true every single time I only flip 10, 10 times. So what I mean by uh, random events are unpredictable in the short run is that when I only do, you know, a short number of tosses, the proportion of heads isn't really what we expect and it bounces around. Now in the long run, we can see this pattern emerging. In other words, this proportion that I've been keeping track of, notice that it tends to settle down right at about 0.5, which is 50%. And so in 1000 flips, now I'll admit I didn't do this by hand. I had a calculator or a, a computer help me out. So this was a simulation. Um, at the end of 1000 flips, we ended up seeing 506 heads. Now we didn't see exactly 50%, but we saw pretty close to 50%. So using this simulation, we would say that the probability of heads is 506 over 1,000. So as a proportion, 0 0.506. This is really close to 50% and it's not exact. But to be perfectly honest, 1,000 flips, I wouldn't even say is in the long run. Certainly it's getting longer, um, but you know, over the long run, I'm talking about 10,000 flips. You know, how many heads would we see? Well, pretty darn close to 50%. So that's why using these simulations, what we would say is that the empirical probability or the probability of getting ahead that I would guess, you know, based off of this simulation is really close to 0.5. So that's why we say that flipping ahead um, has a 0.5 probability. All right, not to mention the fact it's got two possibilities. And so 50% heads, 50% tails. So this is kind of the idea of probability. What happens in the long run? If I do this, you know, repetition, this repeated trials over and over and over again. So why exactly do we need to talk about probability right now? Because trust me, it's going to sound and feel like we're taking a little bit of a, you know, a step away from data and inference. Well, it's because inference is based on probability. Statistic, um, statistics, you know, is really grounded in this idea of probability, especially if you're a frequentist like I am. You know, you think about, well, what happens if we do things over and over and over and over again? Now, we don't need to do things over again. In other words, I don't have to keep obtaining random samples. I'm just going to obtain one, but I kind of have to think about those what ifs. So the probability is going to allow us to quantify the variable of an outcome or the variability of an outcome, excuse me. And so I have to understand how different one outcome is going to be to another and how likely it is to observe that outcome. Just to bring some context into where we're headed, you know, I'm going to go out into the world, I am going to spend my research money, and I'm going to find myself a sample mean. But I'm going to have to understand if I got 20 different students, what would that other sample mean look like? Am I talking about, you know, I first observed a five and this other sample mean might be a 50? Or is this other sample mean going to be more like a six or a seven, right? I have to understand this variability and probability helps me quantify that. 
And so we're really needing to focus, at least on this section, on things like, you know, vocabulary. And this is going to provide a background for us to formally express express our conclusions. Um, so since we need some vocabulary, let's go ahead and start talking about it. All right, so let's consider um, flipping or rolling two fair dice, right? So we've got two dice, they're fair. So when I use the word fair, what I mean is that these dice are balanced. Um, in other words, one of these sides is not more likely to be showing than any of the other sides. They're sort of all equally likely to be showing face up. All right, so we roll these dice and what happens? We get a seven. But if I was to do this over and over and over again, I would always get, you know, a different set of combinations. So what I need to really understand in a probability problem like this is how many outcomes are there? All right, well, if I think about fixing this orange two, what are the possibilities of this blue dice? Um, well, I could get a one. You don't want to see that. I could get a two, so I could get an orange two and a blue two. I could get an orange two and a blue three, and so on, all right? And so those are all of the possibilities that I could have seen if I only fixate on keeping that orange die a two. But clearly that orange die could have been a one, right? And then I would have all of those possibilities for the one. The orange die could have been a three, could have been a four, five, or a six, right? So if I fill in this entire table, what I end up with is six possibilities for the orange, orange die, six possibilities for the blue die. So six times six is 36 possible outcomes. All of these possible outcomes that I'm seeing in front of me, that is called the sample space. So this term sample space, you know, think of it as a list of all possible outcomes. All right, you know, it's kind of hard to list all of these outcomes um, of die. I mean, certainly you could. Um, the notation that we use for sample space is a capital S, and then this equals, and then in brackets, we might list all of the possible combinations, all right? So I would say a possible combination is a one, one. Another possible combination is a one, two, right? And then I could go on listing all of that, right? Just to be graphic, what we did is went ahead and just gave you the pictures of the possible outcomes. But nonetheless, this idea is called the sample space. All right, so considering this sample space, um, why don't we think about the possibility of rolling doubles? Okay, so doubles is this outcome, sometimes also, I should actually say that this is more of an event. So let me change this word here for you. So the term event just means that it is, you know, something within the sample space that I'm interested in. So an event could be a single outcome. So I could be very specific and say rolling two sixes. So that could be an event. Well, that event only has one outcome in it. So I could also just call it the outcome. Now here, the event is rolling doubles. All right, so there's multiple outcomes in this event. And so sometimes what we would use is just a capital letter to reference this uh, event. Sometimes the wording of an event can be kind of long. So we might say instead of rolling doubles, I could say if A equals double or rolling doubles, All right, I kind of defined that event. I could just shorten this up and say the probability of A. All right, so again, kind of getting used to some notation. All right, so in order to find the probability of rolling doubles, I have to think of how many ways could I get these doubles. And so if I look at this out, this uh, sample space, here are all of the outcomes that are within this event A right, they qualify as event A. So the way we find this probability is I would consider the six ways that I could roll a double. 
divide that by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So that would be 36. So if you're good with fractions, this reduces down to 1 sixth. Often probabilities are expressed as a decimal. And if I was to give you advice, I'd say take it out to four decimal places unless you're told otherwise. All right, so the probability of rolling a double, 0.1667. All right, so here's um, another uh, take on finding probabilities. So this game, Aggravation, uh, each player has to roll two dice with the goal of moving marbles around the board game. All right, so if you haven't played, that's probably all you need to know. Um, one of the things that you might be interested in is since you're rolling two dice and you have to add all of the dots together, what's the probability of rolling a sum of exactly seven? Now I can use the same sample space just as just as I did before. Um, and so one of the things that you need to sort of consider is how many combos um, add to seven. That's kind of the big question because in this um, finding a probability, you have to think of how many ways does this event happen or how many combinations of these two dice add up to exactly seven, but we also have to think of the sample space as well. And so with this visual in mind, what we'll do is we'll consider that sample space, um, rolling a seven, and so rolling a seven is, let's see, right there on that picture. All right, but I, that's just one way of rolling a seven. There's other ways. I could get a six and a one, right, or a one and a six, right, because we've got two different colored die, got to consider all of those as well, because I could get a orange five and a blue two, which is different than an orange two and a blue five. So here are all of the different ways that I could get two dice adding up to seven. It just so happens that um, there's six ways of rolling a sum of seven, so the probability of rolling uh, a sum of seven is six, divided by 36, and so it happens to be the same probability as before. That's more coincidence than anything else. All right, so this kind of brings to mind, you know, what if you had a question that involved, you know, summing, uh, you know, seven or more? So I want to think of what this probability distribution is. So if my, um, my, sort of experiment, my probability experiment, or the thing that I'm doing is thinking of all of the possible outcomes for the sum of two dice. Well, then I think to myself, what are the possible sums that could exist? Well, at the very end, I could have two ones, and that would add up to two. And then at the other extreme, I could have two sixes, and that would add all the way up to 12. And so I have sums all the way in between there. And so taking these dice, what I can do is sum them up and see how often each of the sums occurs. All right, so there's only one way that I can get one out of 36. There are two different ways that I can get a, a sum of three, three ways I can get a sum of four, and so on. See how this is kind of emerging here? So the most popular sum is a sum of seven, right? Because there's six different ways that I could get seven. And then it seems that the probabilities are less likely getting smaller and smaller as we uh, sum up to those larger values. So what we did is we just created a probability model or a probability distribution. A probability distribution, what it does is provides me possible outcomes for my event, uh, for my event of interest, you know, kind of lists all the possible outcomes, but it also gives me the probabilities of each one of those outcomes as well. And these probability models are really handy um, because what we're going to need eventually is the probability of some type of um, event, and we'll define that once we get to it. All right, so here are some basic rules of probability. All right, um, well, 
this isn't really a rule, this is more of a definition, but we talked about the fact that the sample space, we use a capital S to represent sample space. It's the set of all possible outcomes in the, um, in the probability experiment. So the, the term random or probability experiment, that just means sort of what game are you playing? What situation are you in? Are you rolling two dice? Are you flipping one coin three times, right? So that right there would be considered, you know, probability experiments. And so think of everything you could possibly see as an outcome. Well, all of those listed together is called the sample space. Now an outcome is a subset of the sample space for which we are interested in finding usually the probability of. Um, so it's each one of those little possibilities that you could occur. So the probability of an, of an event is the number of times the outcome within the event occurs over the sample space. So what we saw earlier was the probability of rolling doubles was the number of ways or the size of the event, the number of ways that I could see um, rolling doubles, that was six, and then we divided that by the size of S, or in other words, the number of outcomes in the sample space. So some rules of the probabilities is that it's always between zero and one inclusive. So in other words, a probability could be zero, it could be one, Probabilities of zero indicate really, really, really unlikely events, right? It's possible to happen, but probably not going to happen, especially if we repeat this experiment over and over again. Most of the time, we won't see it happen. That's probabilities close to zero. Probabilities that are closer to one mean that the likelihood of it happening is kind of high, right? If we repeat this over and over again, um, we are going to see that event occur more often than not. The other thing to consider is that the probability of the sample space is one. What this implies is that if we were to add all of those probabilities together, then we should get one, right, accounting for any kind of rounding error. If you go back on the slide where I showed you that probability model, where we essentially took all of those outcomes and they ended up falling perfectly into one of those columns, well, if I added up all of those fractions, I would get 36 out of 36, which is one. The other thing that we need to consider is the complement. So the probability of not A is the complement. So in other words, I can make the world as simple as my event happens or my event doesn't happen. And so sometimes it's actually easier to find the probability of the event not happening and we can just take that um, event or take that probability, subtract it from one, and essentially I get the other portion. And so we can exploit this rule and you'll see me do that uh, in some examples towards the end of this lesson. All right, so another thing to just sort of consider is that probabilities real close to zero never going to occur. Well, probability of zero, Right, equaling zero, that's never going to occur. But probabilities that are really close to zero just mean that they're very unlikely to occur. A probability of 0.5, we think of that as like a coin flip, right? Half the time it'll happen, half the time it won't, kind of in the long run. And then a probability of one, um, absolutely definitely going to occur, right? In statistics, we are usually not definite. Um, we have probabilities that are in the spectrum, but we usually are not so set on a probability of zero or a probability of one. We kind of lie in the middle somewhere. All right, so fun little um, exercise. I like to kind of illustrate what does, you know, a probability of something really small actually imply? Well, I got my nerd on a couple of years ago, and you know when the uh, lottery was going around? And it got up to, gosh, 1.3 billion and everybody was freaking out. Apparently it was right around 2016. Well, I thought, gosh, you know, I hear through Facebook, all of these people thinking, oh my gosh, I might be able to win, right? Because the amount is so high. Well, I thought, you know, to bring some reality to what the probability is of winning, right? We saw 
time and time again, the probability of winning is one in 292 million. And so um, anytime you hear this one in some number, you think, oh, well, there's a chance somebody's got to win. And so that kind of inflates the feeling that, you know, you might be able to win the lottery. So what does this one in almost 300 million actually feel like? And so what I thought is imagine taking that many $1 bills, right? So almost 300 million $1 bills, because we all know what $1 bills look like. We'll stick them end to end. Start here, put one on the ground, and just end to end making this line of $1 bills. Do you know that that would stretch the United States, right? East coast, west coast, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, about 10 times that string of $1 bills. So then start taking a walk, right? Just walking on your merry way. And then you bend down in this string of $1 bills and you pick up the winning $1 bill, right? So in all of that, the probability of winning the lottery is so incredibly small, right? We know what that feels like now. Well, we would just say that, you know, the probability um, is practically zero, but you have to be careful calling something a probability of zero because zero implies it will never occur. Well, clearly people win the lottery. It's just so unlikely to happen that we kind of make the assumption that right, the probability is close to zero. But again, I just want to urge you to say, don't ever say things are exactly equal to zero, especially if they can occur. All right. So one thing that we are going to start with is using this probability distribution. And so a probability model or a probability distribution, um, what that is, it is a um, function or a graph or a table, but it lists out all of the possible outcomes for X as well as the probabilities of X. So here, instead of using A, I'm just using an X. And so we're using the probability model of rolling um, two dice and having them sum, right? So we have the sum of two and the sum of 12 and all of those in between. So those fractions that you saw in the table earlier or that graph earlier just have been converted into proportions. And so this is the probability model. One thing to keep in mind is that if we were to run a simulation, right, I get on my computer and I have the computer roll the dice and we sum those two dice and record what happens. And then we roll the dice and roll the dice and roll the dice over and over and over again, right, kind of pretending like we're playing a game and we're rolling the dice and we're seeing what we're seeing. Well, in the short run, who knows what the sum is going to be? But in the long run, if we were to do this for repeated trials, 10,000 rolls of a dice, as the number of trials increases, this experimental model, in other words, the simulation that I might run, will get closer and closer to this theoretical probability model. So this theoretical probability model is based on um, more classic probability rules and not this one particularly, but, you know, for other models that we might come across. Um, but just know that there's always kind of an experimental model that exists. If I wanted to just, you know, hunker down and do some simulations or even roll two dice myself and see what the sum ends up coming to, and I, I might keep track of that. So this is known as the law of large numbers. So this tells us that the more observations that we collect, the proportion of occurrences of an outcome will converge or approach that true probability. Remember at the very beginning when I showed you that graph of flipping a coin and keeping track of the probability of heads and how in the short run, the probability or the proportion of heads was all over the place. But in the long run, when I started doing it, you know, more times, like a thousand times, right, it started converging or approaching 0.5. And so that's where our experimental model was getting closer and closer to our theoretical model. All right, so some terminology here. 
When we get into more classic probability rules, um, just know that this video is only going to take you through sort of the very basics. Um, there are classes that are devoted to really diving into this topic of probability much deeper than what I'm going to go to. So again, we're skimming the surface here. Um, so one idea that's really important is thinking about the intersection of outcomes or events. And so again, we might define an event as A and B. Now I have two different events that I'm sort of interested in. The intersection of these just implies that both of them could happen in some probability experiment. And so um, this sort of upside down U, this is a symbol that we use for the intersection. And so if I think of a Venn diagram, a Venn diagram is a rectangle, rectangle that represents the sample space. So again, just kind of a visual um, sample space. Now all of the possible outcomes that are consistent with A Let's say if we have a deck of cards, A could be rolling, uh, pulling um, a red card. B, we could define as pulling a heart. So here we will just do red and, um, oh, let me be a little bit more specific. Let's say um, not a heart even. I think I like that better. So B is pulling an even number, a two, four, six, eight, and so on. Well, then this intersection here, that represents A and B. So it's all of those red cards that are even. That's that overlapping piece. So the intersection of two um, possible events. Now, sometimes, a and B have no common outcomes at all whatsoever. And so we call these two disjoint. So again, if I was to draw a Venn diagram, so we'll call this disjoint so you have a name for the picture. And so um, let's suppose that again, we have this you know, deck of cards this rectangle represents those 52 cards. And now I have the events defined as pulling a club. And I don't know, B this time could be pulling a heart. Clearly, there's nothing in a deck of cards, which is a club and a heart. Those are disjoint events. They could not occur if all I'm doing is pulling out a single card. All right, so therefore the intersection is an empty set. So in other words, the intersection doesn't exist. There is no overlap to those two circles. So we call that an empty set, or in other words, zero. And so one of the things that I'm really going to focus on is when you have these disjoint events, there's a rule in probability that we can use to find the probability of A or B. And that's the focus. Um, sometimes students really have a difficult time considering if two events are disjoint. So what I would recommend is to give yourself a little note here. Um, this is what I use to kind of help me decide if we've got two disjoint events or not. And so you ask yourself, is it possible to perform the probability experiment one time and observe both event A and event B. So you ask yourself, is that possible? So if you answer, yeah, I totally could do this one time and see both A and B on the same thing. Well, then you've got non-disjoint events. In other words, there's some overlapping to the circles. But if you answer, no, it's not even possible to observe a club and a heart, gosh, that doesn't even exist. So if your answer is no to this question that's posed, well, then you have disjoint events. All right. So if we've got these disjoint events, there's an addition rule that helps us answer the question A or B. So I wanted to give you just all the information I could. And so there is this general addition rule. Um, if I'm curious in the probability of the union of two events, right, the union, right, 
kind of, I don't know, sounds like it is. It's the bringing together. I'm interested in either A happening or B happening. Well, then I can use the general addition rule no matter what. Disjoint, non-disjoint, doesn't matter. All right, if you're in my class, what we really focus on more is identifying disjoint events. And so if we have disjoint events, remember that the probability of A and B, that's zero because disjoint events have no intersection. There's A and there's B, but there's nothing in the middle. So this general addition rule essentially would just simplify to probability of A plus the probability of B. Now, I would encourage you to take a moment and just kind of let that sink in for a bit. Um, if you are kind of feeling a little overwhelmed with the language, the terminology, um, once I get into some examples, I think that you'll see this general addition rule is somewhat intuitive, all right? Because we're going to use a probability model like we did before, and really we're just adding up probabilities. But the thing to really keep in mind is when we go through these word problems, recognize the goal. Is the goal to find the probability of the intersection? Or is the probability, or is the goal finding the probability of the union of them? And so the, the big highlight that I'll give you is sort of this language here. Do I want the probability of A or B, right? So A or B. Um, in another example, I'll focus on when we want the probability of exactly A and B happening at the same time. All right, so there is that slight distinction. All right, so let's practice whether or not we actually have disjoint events, and then we'll get into some practice on calculating probabilities. So at this point, what I have is four different scenarios. I want you to pause the video, give yourself enough time to answer whether or not each scenario describes non-disjoint events or disjoint events. All right, I expected you to pause the video because I did not give you enough time during my own pause. So hopefully you have some thoughts written down. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and go through these and clarify any, hopefully any questions that you might have had about it. Okay, so scenario one, um, event A, a randomly selected farmer owns a llama. <laughs> event B, a randomly selected farmer owns a horse. Okay. So in the realm of possibilities, do you think it's possible that we randomly selected Farmer Bob and Farmer Bob owns a llama and a horse? Yeah, I think it's possible, right? <laughs> He's a farmer, right? These horses, these livestock, they live on farms. So it's possible that a farmer has both animals. So because I asked the question, is it possible to see event A and event B on a single farmer? And because my answer was, yeah, totally possible. Well, that implies we have non-disjoint events. Okay. Down to number two. All right. We have, oh, I called this an outcome. Let's suppose, let's keep language consistent and call this an event. Remember, an event could be just a single outcome. All right. Okay, so event C, a randomly selected person is 22 years old, a randomly selected person is 29 years old. All right, is it possible to randomly select one person and that one person is 22 and 29? No, not possible, disjoint events. Okay, number three, a student graduated college with a bachelor's of science. A student did not graduate college with a bachelor's of science. Okay, so they did graduate or they did not graduate. Uh, is it possible that on a single student, they both graduated and did not graduate? No, it's not possible to have one student fit into both of those groups. So again, we have disjoint events. Last one. All right, a field is used to play fo a football game 
and then a field is used to play a baseball game. All right. Now, one of the things that I do kind of want to encourage you all to do is try not to do too many of the, well, what if, what if, what if, right? What if they um, dug up the dirt and repurposed it and um, spent a bunch of money and made a football field into a baseball field, right? That's kind of thinking a little bit too, I don't know, that's getting yourself into a rabbit hole you don't need to get into. So when there's sort of a a minimal information, um, this is sort of getting you to think quickly about these two events. On the surface, what I would say here, and so that again, this might be some guidance I'm giving you if you um, are not getting the answer that I'm getting. You know, a football, uh, a field used to play a football game, right? You need to have the lines painted. You need to have, you know, a long space. Um, Generally, the space needed for a football game is going to be different than the space needed for a baseball game. A baseball field, you have to have, you know, the mound and all the bases set and all that kind of stuff. Now, I would say for the most part, this would be disjoint events, right? I'm going to think simply football field looks different than a baseball field. Probably can't really play both of those games, right? Because you need different lines painted and all of that. Um, Now, is it possible that we repurpose or paint lines so that both of those games could be played. Eh, Possibly. It's a lot more effort. So again, think simply when only, you know, a small little sentence is used to describe these kinds of events. All right. I hope I made sense in that. I know I made sense in my own head. (laughs) Let me know if you have any questions at all on that. All right. So back to this board game aggravation. All right. Uh, Again, what we have to do to play this game is you roll two dice and you move around the board based on the sum of these two dice. And so it's really handy to know what the probability is of all these various sums. And so that's why we've been working with this probability model. So now I might ask the question, what is the probability of rolling a sum of three or less? Okay. So here's where I think about events. Um, Three or less implies rolling a sum of two and rolling a sum of three. Now, these are two different outcomes um, that certainly could not occur on one roll of these two dice, right? Picture yourself rolling the dice. It's only going to be one sum. So these are considered disjoint. And so what I'm really asking here, what is the probability of a sum of three or less? I could reword this. So let me first write down what the goal is. Sum of three or less. So less than or equal to three. I could rewrite this as saying the probability of a two or a three. Notice that I kind of emphasized or. I want this or I want this. So this or is leading me to use the addition rule, the specifically the addition rule for disjoint events. So to use this probability notation and the addition rule, I could find the probability of a two plus the probability of rolling a sum of three. And so using the table, I would just take those probabilities, 0.028, plus 0.056, add those together, and that is 0.081. So here is our final answer. All right, well, how about rolling a sum of three, of more than three? Okay, so more than three implies not three, um, so four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. All of these here fit into this description of more than three. So what we want is the probability of a sum greater than three. Well, just like before, I could easily use the addition rule, right? I could add this probability for rolling a sum of four 
plus this probability, plus this one, plus, plus, plus. And if I had an extra five minutes, I could plug all these numbers into my calculator. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, not a big deal, right? Well, you're talking to me here. I'm a little on the lazy side and I don't wanna press all those buttons. Do you see a quicker way to get to the answer? All right, well, if I think about the fact that all of these probabilities together have to equal one, we already figured out what these two were added together. Why don't I just subtract those two from one and then I get the essentially the sum of the rest of those, right? This is using the complement rule. So the complement of more than three is three or less. So using the complement rule, I could take one minus the complement. So I'm gonna write out the complement just so we can kind of have this all written out correctly. So one minus the sum of less than or equal to three. We already found that on the previous slide, right? Um, so the previous slide, I just again am going to write this out. I'm kind of a, a show your work fanatic. I really like to, especially when I'm writing notes for you all, um, to show you where these numbers are coming from. I hate looking back and thinking, wait, where did that sum come from, you know? And so um, again, the sum of three or less would be these two probabilities added together. And so I put those inside brackets because I want to subtract that quantity from one. So one minus, oh, excuse me, I can just write the answer here. The answer would be point nine one six okay so again the probability of getting a four or a five or a six or a seven or an eight dot 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 all the way up to or 12 well that would be 0.916 and we just got it got to it a little bit faster by using the complement rule all right another question here um, in all of these questions that I'm going over, uh, I always encourage you to pause the video, try to answer it on your own before I go through these solutions. Um, I think it's nice for you all to, you know, have a little bit of struggle, try and do it on your own, and then take this as an opportunity to correct your thinking. Um, that's what I would be doing if we had a face-to-face -face class. So try and mimic that the best you can so that you can really practice these concepts and, you know, get the, uh, get the right answer or at least correct your thinking. All right, well, with that being said, this question, uh, an injection molding process for making steel drinking straws uses three different machines. All right, so that's good information, three machines. So three, I'm a person too that takes these notes. I only like to read a problem once. So if I can take these sort of notes on the edge, um, then I don't have to go back up into the problem as often to try and find the information that I want. So read this one sentence at a time and then pull out anything that might be meaningful. Okay, so at any given moment in the day, the probability of only one machine running is 0 0.05. Okay, so I'm given a probability of only one machine running, so I might take some more notes over here. So the probability of one only 0 0.05. Only two machines is running. So two only 0.25. And only three machines running. That is 0.68. Okay, so now I have all of this on the side, easy to read. I don't have to go back up into the word problem and try and find these numbers. Okay, what is the probability that either no machines are running or, emphasis on that word, one machine is running? All right, so the goal here is, I'm gonna write this down here, give myself some space zero running, that's what we're after, or one running at any given moment. Okay, so the one thing that I'm thinking of is I see this word or, so I'm already primed 
to start using this addition rule. The other thing that I need to consider is if I've got in uh, disjoint outcomes. So by disjoint, I mean that I'm either going to, in any given moment, have nothing running at all, or I can only have one running, right? There's no way that in any given moment I can have both zero and one machine running, right? That just doesn't make sense. So I do have disjoint events. All right, if I'm going to just draw out a probability model, just real quick to see what I'm missing, right, I know that for any given moment, it's possible that we have zero machines running, one, two, or three, right, because that's any given moment. The one probability I don't have is zero machines running, because we have 0.05. We've got 0.25 and 0.68. We've got the other three, but we don't have this one. Well, knowing that all probabilities in a model have to add up to one, I could find this by taking one minus all of these added together, right? So that's the only piece that's missing, 0.05 plus 0 0.25 plus 0.68. All right, so that is 0 0.02. Okay, so now that I have a full probability model, the probability of x, well then um, I can answer this question because this is just, or I can answer this question because this is just a, an addition rule problem. So I'll take the probability of zero running, now that I have it, 0 0.02, plus the probability of one machine running, that's 0 0.02. Five. So our final answer after a little bit of work is 0 0.07. All right, so there you have the addition rule. Okay, so let's kind of switch gears a little bit in the way that we describe these events and talk about independent events. So when I use the term independent, what that means is that the likelihood of one of these events occurring is not being influenced by any of these other events having been occurred, right? So there's like no influence back and forth. So if we have independent events, A and B, well then I can use the multiplication rule for independent events and it's kind of exactly like it sounds. I can multiply these two probabilities together. Now, the result, right, what I get from that is the probability of the intersection, the probability that A and B has occurred, right? So again, the goal in using this multiplication rule is that I'm interested in, all right, A occurs and B occurs at the same time. All right, so let's think of having a pool of um, I don't know, college graduates. I have two events, right? The probability that, um, oh, you know what? I should learn not to make up examples on my own. I have plenty of examples pre, <laughs> pre Dermin for y'all. Um, so let me just rely on that because I kind of had a brain fart and couldn't think of an example right on the fly. Okay, but again, the goal here is that if we wanted the probability of, you know, A and B happening um, at the same time, we can multiply these um, two independent probabilities together. All right, and a fun fact, if I had more than just an A and a B, maybe I had four or five events, all right, all together. I could actually multiply them all together as well. So I just take the probabilities of each one of those and then multiply them out. And you'll see me do that uh, in one of our examples coming up, okay? All right, how about Monopoly? I think we've all maybe come across or played Monopoly, I'm guessing, kind of going out on a limb. But this is also a game where we have to roll two dice. And so um, one of the things that you, you know, certainly want to try and do is, is get uh, doubles. There's things that happen when you roll doubles. So we um, looked a little bit earlier what the chances of rolling doubles was. And so if you don't remember, look back into the video um, because we listed out the sample space. And so rolling doubles, there were six ways we could roll a double 
out of 36 possible outcomes. And so that probability was 0.1667. All right, so let's suppose you rolled doubles on your first roll. What is the chances of rolling doubles again on your second roll? All right, so this is really setting us up for the intersection of two events, right? One event is rolling a double on the first roll. The next would be rolling a double on the second roll. Okay, so rolling doubles and rolling doubles again. All right, so I'm setting us up for that multiplication roll. But first, what we have to really answer is the outcome of the second roll independent of the first. That's one thing I have to make sure. All right, so in this example, I have two dice, right? When I, when I roll, right, the dice don't remember what happened in the roll prior. Right? Each time I roll, it's kind of a, a start over, right? So there's no influence. Um, there's nothing that's being done that is going to dictate I can't have doubles again. So in other words, I've got independent, uh, independent events. All right, in contrast, what if I was pulling a name from a hat, right? If I pulled a name and then I kept the name, then I went to go pull another name out of the hat. Well, the probability on that second pull is going to be influenced by sort of what did I pull on that first round? Those are dependent events. Okay, so since we do have independent events, in other words, the outcome of the second roll is not being influenced or changed, by what happened on the first roll, I can say that the probability of rolling doubles, um, first roll, and doubles um, on second, right? The focus here is I want both of those things to happen. Therefore, I can use the multiplication rule. So the multiplication rule would be doubles on the first and we multiply that by doubles on um, the second and we know what the probability of rolling doubles is. So we can take that one sixth times one sixth and so our answer as a decimal is 0 0.0278. Okay, so that is our final answer. All right, well, I'm gonna let you take this a step further. All right, if you, uh, a player gets doubles on three rolls or three times that they roll, um, well, they have to go straight to jail. That is a bit unfortunate. So what's the probability of that even happening all right, so what is the chance that a player will roll three doubles in a row? Right, I'm gonna give you a second to think about it. I've given you some options to get you started. How would I figure this out? All right, so the probability of getting doubles is this answer A. So this is just the probability of rolling doubles. Okay, um, this is just a bogus answer that doesn't really mean anything. Here we have these probabilities that are being added together. And so remember when we add probabilities, we're really answering the question about a union of events, right? Rolling doubles on the first or rolling doubles on the second or rolling doubles on the third. All right, so in other words, I don't really care when it happens, I just roll a double. Now, when I want the rolling doubles three in a row, what I'm really interested in is doubles. So we'll be doubles on first and doubles on second. And I'm really emphasizing the and because that's your clue to multiply these things together doubles on third, okay? So this is how we would find that probability out. Turns out it's really small. So if you did this out together, 0 0.0046, all right? All right, next question. 
An unbalanced coin is tossed two times. So when you ever get information about an unbalanced coin, so in other words, one of the sides is more likely to show up than the other, you have to know what is the probability of it landing heads or tails, right? Because we have to know to what degree is this coin unbalanced. So you have to be given that information. If you're not, and it just says a coin is flipped, always assume it's a fair coin. Okay, so um, I should also say if you're ever doing like a textbook kind of a problem or an exam problem. Um, all right, so getting heads to land face up. Um, so getting a head to land face up is point four. So this is where I always like to write some notes here as I'm reading. Looks like the probability of a head for this unbalanced coin is point four. Find the probability distribution. Right. Another name that you've seen in this video is probability model. Uh, in other words, what we need is find the probability of each outcome in the sample space. All right, so this is really involving a few of our skills because I need to list all possible outcomes for two tosses of a coin. So the very first outcome that I could list in no particular order is two heads. Given the information in the problem, the probability of a head and a head, right, on the second toss, right, emphasis on and, means that I can multiply these probabilities together. So 0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16. Now I need the next outcome in the sample space. Again, in no particular order, we could get a head on the first toss and a tail on the second toss. So multiplying these two probabilities together, we have 0.4 for the heads and 0.6 for the tails, right? If I think about it, that's actually the 0.6, that's using the complement rule, right? Because uh, if I don't have a head, the complement of that would be I got a tail because that's the only other outcome in, the, in this situation. So anyway, we have 0.24 there. Uh, another outcome is that I could get a tail on the first toss and a head on the second toss, right? We would consider this a different outcome because we only have one coin. So I have to think about what could happen on either the first or the second toss. And then finally, the other thing that could happen is I could get two tails. So when I toss a coin twice, these are the only things that I could possibly observe. Here we have our probability distribution. All right, another concept that is really, you know, important in this section is the idea of sampling with and without replacement. Um, again, what we're doing in this section is kind of building skills that we will recall or use later on in, a, uh, in the term. And so sampling with replacement just means that the conditions essentially are the exact same every single trial that is conducted. Right? You might think of you know, putting the marble back into the jar or replacing the item back into the pool so it's possible that I select that same item again. Sometimes I do this, sometimes it's not really necessary to replace the item, whatever that item might be. So what are some examples of sampling with replacement? Um, I'm kind of thinking of you know, maybe catch and release. Um, right, if you don't tag, if you don't tag animals. All right, so you might catch a fish, measure the fish, put it back in the pond. Um, you don't tag it, you just measure it and put it back. Well, technically, you know, if you're fishing, it is possible that you, you know, catch that same fish again. You've got good bait, it likes it, it wants to come back, I guess. Um, you know, might not be the best technique for this given situation, but that would be like an example of sampling with replacement. Now, sampling without replacement just means that um, subsequent trials are going to be influenced by what happens on earlier trials because you're not replacing the item back into the pool. All right, I have a jar of marbles. I select a marble. I look at the color, record the color, and then I put the marble down on the table before I select the next marble. Um, you know, I randomly select a student and I send them a survey and I record their responses. 
it doesn't make much sense for me to, you know, essentially allow that student to be selected again. I already know that Bob doesn't like mustard. I don't need to ask Bob that question again on my survey. <laughs> so examples of sampling without replacement would be, you know, something like selecting participants for a survey. That's one example. Um, selecting participants. for a survey. Okay, so which of these sampling types of sampling would result in independent outcomes? Well, if we think of independent outcomes, that means that the occurrence of one event is not influencing any future events. So I would say with replacement, is what would result in independent outcomes, whereas dependent outcomes result from sampling without replacement. And so here's the big trick out in the world. We have a lot of these probability, um, a lot of these sort of probability rules that we have to work with. And in reality, we do a lot of sampling without replacement, but we also have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, assumptions we have to make about independent outcomes. So sometimes what we do is that when the population is so large, it doesn't matter too much if I sample with or without replacement or, or I'm um, thinking of it that way, right? Think of, you know, a pond that um, has millions of little fish in it, right? Putting a fish back into that pond, you're probably never going to catch that fish again. Um, so anyway, the idea of sampling with and without replacement is an important one to consider, um, but sometimes we can kind of scoot around this actually being an issue when we go calculating probabilities. Okay, so here's a question for you. A simple random sample is sampling with replacement. Is that true or false? All right, did you answer false? There you have it. Yeah, so a simple random sample involves me, um, you know, being able to select individuals from a list. So here, let's say, are my individuals, and I randomly select them. So what if I randomly selected this one, this one, and this one, and they now become my sample? So that's simple random sample. Notice that I didn't have any repeats, right? My simple random sample does not require that I have randomly selected this person twice, right? It gives me a set of, you know, different individuals. So it is sampling without replacement. And again, that's what we do pretty often. All right. I know this has been a bit of a long video, um, but we're finally at the very end using counting techniques. Now, this is an added topic. Uh, some intro classes, they, they don't get into these sort of teaching or these counting techniques, but I find it really important just so that you can wrap your head around how many possible samples are there in some population. And so first and foremost, we have a pretty simple multiplication rule for counting. So if I wanted to know how many possible outcomes are there, well then I take the number of possibilities, let's say for the first object, and times that by the number of possibilities for the second object and so on. Or, you know, um, for example, we had two dice, right? So we had two things. And when I came up with that sample space of 36 possible combinations of two dice, I knew that there were six possibilities for the orange die and six possibilities for the blue die. So six times six is 36, right? If I was flipping a coin and rolling a dice, right? How many combinations would I see there? Well, rolling a dice has six possible sides. The coin has two sides to it. So combinations of um, a coin flip and a roll of a die, well, there's only 12 there. Okay. Now a permutation is the number of possible outcomes 
when there is a specific order, right? And they come from a sample that, that um, is without replacement. And so to explain a little bit of what this is, up at the very top, I have N factorial. All right, so just to be clear, N is not really excited. <laughs> this is N factorial. So for example, four factorial just means that I take four, multiply that by one, uh, four minus one, so that's three, multiply that by three minus one, which is not three, it is two, until I get all the way down to one. All right, so four times three times two times one, that's what, 12 times two, 24. Okay, so that's four factorial. So if I want the total number of possible outcomes when there's a specific order, well then what I need to do is I need to take n, multiply that by n minus one, right, times n minus two times n minus three, until I am left with essentially no more objects. And um, I do have an example of what this looks like in just a bit. Now a combination is, in my opinion, a little bit more helpful, what we tend to come across more often, and it's when there is no order, right? There's no order. I just want essentially to know how many ways can I randomly select three individuals from a group of 10, right? I just want to know the combinations of three names in no particular order. Well, then what I would do is I take n factorial, n is my sample size, and then I divide that by k factorial. So in this case, k is the that smaller subgroup that I'm selecting. All right, so you know how many ways could I get three individuals from a set of 10? Well, three would be the k, 10, would be the n, because that's my total group. And so this notation right here, this is a special notation that um, reads n choose k. So again, this notation isn't any type of division. It's sort of a thing on its own. Again, it's n choose k, right? Out of n objects, how many ways could I choose k of them? And again, give me a second, and we're going to go through a couple ex examples on how to use these formulas, okay? All right. So first uh, question, we have three applicants for manager, four applicants for supervisor, and then five applicants for front end assistant. All right, only one is going to be hired for each position. How many combinations of employees can be made if we consider each applicant equally qualified? Okay. So, so here, essentially, what we are thinking of is how many possible ways are there for us to get a manager, a supervisor, and a friend and assistant? If they're all equally qualified, I'm kind of just pulling a name out of uh, a pile. All right, so how many combinations? Well, I see that there are three applicants for manager. So how many combinations are there total? Well, there's three options for the first um, manager. There are four applicants for the supervisor. And so there are five applicants for the front end assistant. So when we multiply all of this together, um, you know, we get the total number of individuals, um, so that is 90. All right, so 90 total combinations of manager, supervisor, and friend and assistant. Okay, so the next question, suppose we have five students that are in a club. All right, so five students, how many ways could they line up for a group photo? Okay, so for this one, we have five students total, so one, two, three, four, five. I'm thinking of lining up for a group photo would imply, you know, a little bit of ordering that goes on because if we were to take the group, okay, who's going to stand first? Well, there's five students that could stand at the very beginning of the line. Well, based on 
whoever stands in the front of the line, well then there's only four students that could be next. Three students that could be next, two, and then once we've got all of those positions set, there's only one left over, right? So if we multiply all of these together, we get 120 different lineups. So this is considered a permutation because there is some ordering that goes on, right? Because once we have somebody sat in the very first um, position, we're kind of in a way sampling without replacement, right? We are not putting that person back in line, they're, they're taken. So now we have four individuals to work with in that second position, three individuals and so on. So this is a permutation. All right, we still have these five students in the club, but now we wanna know how many ways could they vote for club president and vice president? Okay, so there is some ordering here, president and vice president. And so when we vote for president, there are five different students that are possible. And vice president, there are only four possibilities, right? Because if somebody's president, well, then the other four have the possibility of being vice president. So five times four is 20. Again, this is a permutation, but because we only have two different positions, I only had to multiply five times four. I didn't have to take it all the way down to one like I did in this group lineup photo. Well, in the group lineup photo, we're considering all five of them as part of the group. Okay, so how many ways could they vote for two officers? Well, two officers, um, you know, they hold the same title. There's no ordering at all. So this would actually be considered a combination. And so I am going to do this kind of the long way. I know calculators have a nice quick button that you can use, but just in case you don't have it, I want to explain what we've got going on. So in this case, we have N, which is our total number of individuals to work with. So that's five. There are two officers, and so in this case, considering that formula I gave you, K equals two. Um, and so from five individuals, how many ways could I just get a set of two students? So what we have is five choose two. Using the formula, we have five factorial up on top, and then down on the denominator, the first thing is k factorial, 2 factorial, times n minus k, 5 minus 2, and then factorial. Um, again, I'm going to show you the long way just so you can see sort of how this works if you have to do it by hand. We've got as a numerator, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. In the denominator, that first bit, 2 factorial, 2 times 1. All right, in the parentheses here, 5 minus 2, that's 3. So we have 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1. There we have it. And so to make life just a little bit easier on myself, I can do some canceling. Um, so 3, 2, 1 cancels with 3, 2, 1. So I'm left with 20 on top two on the bottom, my final answer, 10. 10 ways that I can select two officers from this group, assuming that uh, president and vice president haven't been determined yet, I suppose. All right, another question here, and again, please pause these before you get to hear my answer. I want you to, to think about and try and approach these on your own. All right, suppose you have 10 volunteers for a specific job, but you can only select three individuals to train. How many different combinations of, oh, excuse me, that should say three, three people can be formed? Okay, so here, you know, I can almost make this simple as I have three, or I'm sorry, I have 10 um, to choose from. I don't care who it is, I just want three to train. Um, how many combinations are there? So this is again another combination because there's no order. I just want to know, you know, how many ways can I pick three from a pile of 10? So this is 10 choose three. 
This is a combination. So to write this out, we have 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 10 minus 3 factorial. Um, in your calculators, if you can find this factorial button, it's usually underneath um, some probability menu. You can, you know, do this all in one step. You don't have to write this all out. Um, but some students don't have that functionality on their calculators. So push comes to shove. You can always write things out this way. So 10 times 9 times 8 times you get the point all the way down to 1. I might do 7 right there. So this is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. All right, down here on the bottom, 3 factorial. When I expand that out, 3, 2, 1. And 10 minus 3 is 7. So we have 7 factorial here. 7 times 6 times all the way down to 1. Now I got kind of sloppy here towards the end because I know that I'm able to cancel some of this out. All right, 7 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 cancels with 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So really what I have on the numerator is 10 times 9 times 8. And then on the denominator, we have 3 times 2 times 1. So this is 720 on top, 6 on the bottom. My final answer is 120. And so I want to pause here just for one quick second. We have... 120 possible sets of three people if I have 10 to choose from. Can you imagine that? 120 possible combinations. Now, why we're even talking about this in the first place is that, again, we're going to get into a time where I talk about, you know, the likelihood of observing a certain sample mean. Well, if I have a population of, say, 10,000 students to choose from, and I only need a sample of 30, can you imagine how many different sets of 30 there are? If I have 10,000 to choose from, right, that would be, so here's um, a side. This is not important. I'm going on a tangent here, you know, but if I had 10,000 students to choose from, and all I can afford is a sample of 30, can you imagine how large that number is going to be? Well, we're going to get to a point when I need to sort of consider what is the sample means for each one of those possible samples, right? When I only had 10 and I'm choosing three, there's 120 possible samples from that, right? This is going to be mind blowing, but don't worry because I'm going to teach you how to sort of deal with all of that. And in fact, we've got some theorems that we can rely on, which do make lives, our lives pretty simple. Okay. So no worries there, but this is kind of the reason why, why I'm even talking about it. Okay. Last example that I'm going to let you go. All right. You are at a Christmas party um, and you are given the task of drawing two names of employees to receive a prize. You're doing this without replacement. All right, there are 35 people at the party. Each name's put into a jar. The first name you draw will get the grand prize, and the second name you draw is going to get the runner-up gift. How many ways can the grand prize and runner-up be assigned to employees? So again, this is just asking me how many different combinations of grand prize winner and runner-up do we get? Well, if in this pile of names there starts off with 35, um, well, if we're going to pick the grand prize winner first, 35 possibilities. Well, if you don't get the grand prize, then you're left over. So there's 34 employees left that are possible runner-up gifts. So this is a permutation. We are only multiplying 35 and 34 because there's only two gifts that are given out. So we stop at 34 and these two added together, 1,190 not added together, excuse me, multiply together. All right, everyone. I know that I covered a lot in this video. Um, I hope that y'all found it helpful and um, let me know if you have any questions. All right. Take care.